and I will keep admitting people as we go along. So I'm going to go ahead and just welcome everybody and we'll get started uh, at uh, 7.05. So we'll just say hi to everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Um, just as a beginner, my name is Sarah. I'm a bookseller uh, at Eagle Harbor Books, uh, an event coordinator, and we are so excited to have Kathleen and Claudia this evening. So woo, and I will just keep admitting people until we are ready to start going. Um, and welcome again. All righty. This is so exciting, Kathleen, to talk about your book. Yes, thank you, Claudia, for being part of this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. After all, I know you don't have anything else to do, right? <laughs> no, I'm here. I'm happy. <laughs> Have we had a nice day? Have we had a nice day? Yeah. Uh, yes, we're probably going to have a, a thunderstorm on the island, so we we should say all our important things first, right? Absolutely. Claudia, have you had a nice day? I have. I have. I I had a good session with my students. So I didn't kick myself out of Zoom in the course of the class. So that was a success. Wonderful, <laughs> that's done. so important. Yeah. Good, well, I think the majority of people have joined us. I will continue to admit people as I see them pop up, um, but I will go ahead and start going. Um, this evening, we do only have uh, till 740, so we wanna keep things brief and short. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start here um, with introductions with both our beautiful authors, Kathleen and Claudia. And at about 7.25, we're going to open it up to question and answer. If you do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the group chat and I will keep um, my eye on them so we're able to see everything. We do ask that everybody stay on mute except for Claudia and Kathleen so that you know everything stays kind of quiet and everybody's able to hear everything. Um, again, if you do have questions, go ahead and post them in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna be um, posting relevant links to things that they will be talking about in the chat as well if you have questions or wanna learn more about what they've been doing. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start with introductions. Uh, and then uh, first we're gonna turn it over to Claudia and then Kathleen will talk and we'll do questions at the end. So I'm gonna start. So to begin with, Kathleen Alcala has received a Western State Book Award, the Governor's Writers Award, the International Latino Book Award and two Artist Trust Fellowships. She has been recognized by Contina and is a recent Whitley Fellow, a previous Hugo House writer in residence, and a founding editor of the Raven Chronicles. Her sixth book, the Deepest Roots, explores our relationship with geography, food, history, and ethnicity. <laughs> Kathleen was born in Compton, California, to Mexican parents and lives in the Northwest. Not one tale is like another, yet all together they form a beautiful whole, a whole where no one would, uh, where one would like to stay forever, from Ursula Le Guin's On Mrs. Vargas and the Dead Naturalist. And I would also like to introduce beautiful Claudia. Claudia Castro Luna is an Academy of American Poets Poet Laureate Fellow, the recent Washington State Poet Laureate from 2018 to 2021, and Seattle's inaugural Civil Poet 2015 to 2018. She is the author of One River, A Thousand Voices, which she'll be reading from later this evening, the Pushcart nominated Killing Marias, and also shortlisted for Washington State 2018 Book Award in Poetry, and the chat book, This City, uh, excuse me, shortlisted, oh, I, excuse me. Her most recent nonfiction is forthcoming in There's a Revolution Outside My Love, Letters from a Crisis, due out next month. Born in El Salvador, she came to the United States in 1981. We are so excited to have both these wonderful authors here with us this evening. And again, we will turn it over to Claudia first and ask questions at the end. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. 
Thank you, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction. It's, it's so great to be here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It gives me such pleasure to be in conversation with Kathleen Alcala, whose book I read over the summer. And I have to say, I was a, a, when I could see that I had 10 pages left, I started fretting because I thought, what am I going to do when I finished this wonderful book? What's, what comes after reading a wonderful book? Um, so I'm very happy that we get to talk about it. Um, I will read a very brief excerpt from the book, One River, A Thousand Voices, which is an unusual book. It's an accordion book that opens up, let me see, opens up like this. And it just, it's, it's, a, it's one poem. The entire book is one poem, as long as the river, the River Columbia. And I wrote the book as I was serving as Washington State's Poet Laureate. I traveled up and down the Columbia River um, and engaged with communities alongside it, writing poems um, with them, listening, sharing thoughts and stories. And it was just an amazing, amazing time. And um, I was one, one stop, I designed this tour along eight different stops and I had one stop left and COVID came. And so it was uh, with a heavy heart that I couldn't, that I couldn't end the tour. Um, but I have lots of memories and just, it was just an amazing experience. And this book came out of, came out of that. So it's a, it's a book about the river, the Columbia River, and it begins long, long ago, um, as the river started to flow and take shape. This is, of course, an imaginary venture on my part, imagining what it must have been like, imagining how in this earliest time before there were humans, uh, the river, the course of the river took shape. And then when humans arrived, um, what that was like, how they came to call themselves peoples of the river, and river people uh, completely fusing themselves to the course of the river itself. I address the river um, directly in the poem. And so when you hear me say you, um, I'm picking up the poem way at the end, uh, the little excerpt I will read, I'm, I'm referring to the river. And um, I think that's, I think that's when, so when you hear me say before all the befores, the book begins with before, there was, you know, there was before all the befores when there was only lava and, and ice and the river began its flow. So it, it has this incantation. So here I am picking it up way down. Um, before all the befores, you, river, had already been called a thousand and one names, each name for every animal creature and vegetable spirit that ever breathed, mated and died, that ever flowered or shed a spore, each tree, each flower, each bulb, fish, mammal, insect, bird, each calling you a name of her own, each diurnal and nocturnal creature, her features and body and her own melodious name for life, the owl who swoops to snatch in night's downy hush, the unsuspecting frog, trout whose rainbow swagger flares gainfully your waters as we call out to them, they call out to you, woodpecker tribes, beaver bands, coneflower clumps, each living thing with her own ardent name on the hoof, on the scale, on the feather, on the fur, on the leaf, on the bark, one river, a thousand names, a thousand voices chanting river songs, singing songs of place, charting songs of belonging. Sage women and wise men sense these non-human nomenclatures at the margins of their knowing, but never possess them, for the names belong only to you, river, and to silence, to the language of time. O oh, river, impervious to human foibles, kinks, and skill, to wolves' backbone, and cunning, to salamander's tremulous heart, to the rustling of poplar tree leaves, river, you, against whom people and creatures harness survival and hope, what names do you call us? 
when wings at sunset fold and later when we surrender to night our eyes. For it is hubris to grant faith and dominion only to alphabet and sword. It is hubris not to consider that you who for millennia have run and pumped don't also have manner and fashion of your own just because your course was marked on a map as territory and a four syllable name on you imposed does not make your riverness conquerable. For all we know and think we know human experience Experience is pinhead to the universe of your waters. Yours is the thingness and riverness of you. O oh, great river, O oh, giver of life, O oh, keeper of time, then, then, as you shall again flow supreme, singular to your mission, that being your effulgent return first to ocean, then to cloud, then to rain and snow, to return back down mountains, channeling rills over mossy hills, fitting rivulets, quietly resting for a moment in the swirl of a chilly eddy, hustling onto streams eventually to your own mighty torque and rhythm whose thunderous physics bolt you forward through canyons, around bends, past floodplains, shaping plateaus and prairies to estuary and delta to empty yourself, unrelenting for the future. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, the title of the book, I forgot to say the title of the book, as I, as I travel up and down the river, um, I am just noticing the flora and the fauna all around me and just the, ma the majesty of this waterway that we have running through Washington state. Um, I realized, you know, we call the river Columbia, but it's been called many, many, many names, right? Over millennia. And why is it that we should only have names for it? Birds must call it something because they depend on the river as we do. And coyotes must call it something and fish must have their own names. And trees must have names for it. We just don't speak those languages. And so that's how the name of the book came about and how um, that, that was really the spark, the spark for the poem was that thought sitting along the river and thinking, you know, what, what, what are their names? Creatures have their own volition too. They are also spirits just like we are, right? Um, so just that little story, which I realized gives me a nice little segue into Kathleen's book because um, Kathleen's is a beautiful book. It's, it's just a really wonderful, uh, it's the, vo the voice, the writing is so lyrical, it's so expansive, the characters are so richly drawn, the landscape is so rich, it's almost a character in the book. And, um, and there's so many stories woven together, the story of crypto Judaism in Latin America, the story we see these two countries, Mexico and the US emerging right into modernity, one could say. Um, we see various cultures converging, uh, Anglo culture, Mexican, the Spanish, the old colonial Spanish uh, remnants are still there in the book. And of course, all the indigenous people who inhabited these lands before anybody else showed up. Um, so Kathleen, I was thinking, where where did the spark for your book come from? Um, because I've heard you say you started, you, you wrote a short story about it, but it's such a such a universe. How how did you how did you come to the idea? Well, um, I was writing a set of short stories, and thank you, Claudia. Thank you for that beautiful reading. And if you didn't say the name of your book yet, it's One River, A Thousand Voices. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it in person. I want to see this, uh, this accordion unfolding of part of the river. I also wanted to say that it really reminds me of the whole notion of Finnegan's Wake, which begins and ends with the word river run. Uh -huh. um, so keeping uh, that, that's a, a layer that I have 
under the layer that you wrote. Uh -huh. um, so I started writing short stories based on my family's storytelling tradition. And by that, I mean um, nine uh, brothers and sisters, my mother and her brothers and sisters would get together and tell stories that only made sense in that context. They were the only ones who had that shared experience. Um, but they were interesting stories. They were so unlike the stories that I heard in the surrounding culture uh, that when I decided I was really interested in writing, that's what I ended up drawing on were those stories and that style of storytelling, which is very mm. inclusive and expansive and didn't necessarily have endings in the way that we think of, of how we're taught to end a story in graduate school. And so I felt as though I could make up different endings for the same beginning, you know, a, a situation in which people would introduce themselves into something and then make one decision or rewriting the story, make a different decision. So when I got to the last story, I realized that it was completely different from the others. It was set at the late, late 19th century. And um, this last story was the first chapter of a novel. Mm. So that's when I got it, got started writing um, Spirits of the Ordinary. At the time, I didn't know it was called Spirits of the Ordinary, of course. Um, it had another name. It was uh, Casas Grandes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the press went around and around and around, and we ended up with spirits of the ordinary. Got to be Casas Grandes shows up in the in the book. Yes, yes, it does, and I think it is uh, the a subtitle, a tale of Casas Grandes. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. Uh, um, so, would you read a little bit from it, Kathleen? I would love to. I'm just going to read a paragraph. And um, it's a description of the main character's mother, the main character, Zacharias, as much as there is a main character in a book like this. Mm -hmm. And he's from a crypto Jewish family that lives in Santiago, Mexico. And he wants, he's always yearning to be out in the countryside looking for gold. But here's a description of Mariana. When Julio's wife went outside, animals seemed to come to her. The beautiful courtyard, which might have been peaceful and empty all morning, would suddenly fill with doves, cooing and strutting. They would even land on her outstretched hand. Julio had watched her offer her silent lips for an affectionate peck. Squirrels came to her and dogs dropped their fierce demeanor. All nature seemed in accord with her as though in opposition or apology for the terrible treatment she had received at the hands of humanity as an innocent child. Mariana took all of this as her due, remaining calm and demure, casting her eyes down when on her husband's arm in public. Only when she was alone did she seem to bloom, enclosing all of nature in her generous embrace. Mariana used the sign language with Julio that she and her father had devised and shared through her adolescence. Her face and hands were so expressive that she seldom had to resort to pen and paper to convey, to convey her thoughts. Mm -hmm. And just, as you might pick up, she's mute. She does not speak out loud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I actually reread uh, uh, um, several parts of the book and, and I um, reread the part where she, her trauma that then renders her mute, right? And, and was thinking how these women characters in this book are each so different from, from the other. It's really, it's really amazing. And I, when I think, when I was thinking about that, the female characters, I was thinking of the, you know, of the Zacarias's wife, um, I was thinking of the photographer, for instance, I was thinking of the twins who are androgynous. Um, mm -hmm. And then I came across Mariana and I thought, 
oh, she is also so particular. She's, she's so particular, all of them are. Yes, and she kind of comes into her own in um, the third novel, Treasures in Heaven, where she and Julio go to Mexico City. So I didn't sit down and, and decide, okay, I'm gonna have four women of import in this book and they're all gonna be different. They each just introduced themselves and, and said, well, I'm in this book. So what <laughs> could I say, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, it was, um, it's almost like making a fire, your book. There is, you introduce these characters and, and it, you don't, they are each distinct their voices are distinct. Their 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 what they're interested. Their dramas are distinct, and then yet they they weave to create this this big fire at the end. It's almost like kindling is how I I thought of the book. Each character coming in, and suddenly you have, and you think, okay, so we have this character. We have Zacarias off on his own. We have uh, Mariana. We have Julio, and suddenly here we are with this um, just, I just love the way you wove all of it together. Thank you. I was thinking recently that um, I would never teach someone to write the way I wrote this first novel. I make all of these mistakes that one makes with the first novel. There's uh, too many characters and there's too much interior dialogue, um, but somehow it worked. It, it came together and uh, into a fairly smooth narration. And I think part of it is what you were mentioning earlier that nature is a character in the book. And listening to you read um, from One River, A Thousand Voices, I was talking earlier when we were um, preparing about how different our work is and how you address um, sort of the common good, the, the voices that every person can have and can add to nature. And I think of my writing as being sort of solitary of something one does in private. <laughs> but when I think about um, the notion of nature as a character in my book, then I really see the commonalities between our work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was really taken with the landscape, uh, the landscape descriptions in the book because they're so sleeping <laughs> and alive. And the, it, it reminds me of Eva Figgs. You know that old, Eva Figgs wrote a book called Light. I don't know if you, if you remember, it was a long time ago, but in it, she um, pursues this idea of painting and how painters, the impressionists really want, try to capture light in their paintings. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that through writing? And when I was reading um, your book, I kept on going back to that notion of capturing light on the page because they are almost like paintings, some of the landscapes, and they show up a lot throughout the book. Um, that, that, yeah, they're almost like they're a character in, in the book. And so I, how did you write this? Uh, did you travel to this, to this area where the book takes place? I've been to many of these places. Um, I have cousins in Chihuahua, Mexico. So we would drive every year, every summer, uh, which is a two and a half day drive from uh, San Bernardino, California. And I think that I was imagining Zacharias riding his horse as he leaves town and rides north. Um, and so it has to unfold at that pace. It has to have a different rhythm to it than the rhythms that we have today and how we live our lives. So we have first one scene and then we have, we'll, we'll have a town and then we'll have nature and then we'll have another town. And in each of those places are different people living their lives in completely different ways, right? And this is where the different women show up um, as the book unfolds. So I think that rhythm and space were very important to making this book work. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that much of it was written on the floor of a ballet studio while my son was taking piano lessons. So I think that there is some influence of classical music and the rhythm and pacing of classical music that is in this book. Mm, I love that. That's really wonderful because uh, you were talking earlier about the character's interiority and how much inner dialogue there is. And 
um, and how it absolutely works uh, and actually is necessary for the success of the book to, to have Zacharias just wander in his head, just to you mm -hmm. know hear him considering where he is, what he has done, the engagement with other characters. And, um, and maybe that, that adds to that because as he's on his horse, what is the name of the horse again? She has a name. What is her name again? Lagata. La gata, I love that. Yes. 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 So she, he's he's engaging in this, which you're right, as slows the pace. So we could really right. see the landscape. We could really take it in. And she's a walker. She's a particular kind of horse that always keeps a, a foot on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I read someplace that the West was was taken over by by horsemen on walking horses, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to sit in the saddle that many hours a day. Um, yeah. So yeah. she's that type of a horse. And it, when you think about Cormac McCarthy and the, the importance of a man's horse to him and, and the tools of the time, you know, the, the vocabulary that he re reconstructed in order to, uh, to write his books, even though I didn't use it, I had that very much in mind. Um, mm -hmm. Should we go to questions now? Yeah, we actually okay. have a couple questions so. popping up. So um, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Our first question uh, is, I am curious how long it took you to write the novel and how many drafts? Well, I tell people that it takes me about 12 drafts to write anything. Um, and I, I still will stick by that all the way through 12 times. Um, how long did it take me? It took me about five years to write that. My first book, uh, Mrs. Vargas and the Dead Naturalist, was published in 1992, and um, Spirits of the Ordinary was published in 1997. Mm. Wonderful. And our second question, um, in an article on magical realism, Alberto Rios wrote that it arises out of culture and language. Kathleen, can you comment on that and how it relates to your writing? Claudia, magical realism is more often associated with prose than poetry. Uh, but do you think this is something that has ever arisen in your poems? Mm -hmm. Why don't you go, go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I, I was just thinking. I agree that it's it's assigned to prose more often. Um, I mean, I think when I read Garcia Marquez for the first time, I was a college student um, who had begun to who who had worked so hard to learn English. I was beginning to get really rusty with my Spanish, and I had a couple of Honduran friends who really made fun of me and set me right. So I realized, what am I doing, you know, and, and returned to, to Spanish to cultivate my Spanish and read Garcia Marquez because uh -huh. they insisted I should read it. And opening that book from the first pages, I realized I knew who he was. Uh -huh. I thought, but these are just the stories that my grandmother tells, uh -huh. you know, yes. this, this is my, for the first time I felt like, this is the first book where I saw myself reflected and the way in which I grew up in a little town on the border between El Salvador and Guatemala. And, and these stories that just happened with that, almost without beginning, ongoing stories, like you were saying, Kathleen. I think that definitely I grew up with that, with that kind of storytelling. And I mean, just to, before you answer it, Kathleen, just to, I think the, the river poem is a, is a, you know, an extension of that is just not in, in magic realism in the world in which I grew up, there were all kinds of spirits and animals that showed up to protect you and that descended from trees and that had powers um, and characters that were non-human, but very real. Um, so I, it just seems that's the way it is. Do you know what I mean? And it will, right. be, of course, then come into our stories and poems. That's the landscape. That's the given. Yes, in fact, it reminds me of Sabrina Vorvulier, who's a writer who wrote a book called Ink, I-N-K, that uses characters that way. And I think she's El Salvadorian. Beautiful. I just wanted to interrupt quickly. We got an extension of our time limit. So we're going to actually go to 8 o'clock if we're able to. Um, OK. 
uh, yeah, Zoom gave us an extension. So if anybody has continual questions or want to ask, let us know. Claudia or um, Kathleen, if you need to leave early, let us know right away and we can uh, cut it a little short. But we Where were are we going to go? <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying what Kathleen is about to say. I know. We're still, we're still home. Um, <laughs> Keep going. We got all. OK. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I think, Claudia, you're closer to my age than I thought you were. You're so youthful. Uh, but I too was in college. I think I was a freshman when I read A Hundred Years of Solitude and I had exactly the same reaction. I thought, oh, these are just like the stories my family tells. So I found a copy of, of it in Spanish. I think it was about when uh, it was first translated into English. Mm -hmm. So uh, I found it in Spanish and sent it to my parents and they agreed that it was very much like, um, their storytelling traditions. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was later, eight years later, when I went into the program at the University of Washington to study creative writing. And at that point, that was the first time I heard the term magical realism. Mm -hmm. And that was from, um, oh, let's see, Bejarano, you know, Yvonne Yarbrough Bejarano was a professor at the University of Washington at the time. And she had been asked by uh, theater to write a description of what was magical realism to go with the production of uh, Blood Wedding mm -hmm. by, who's the playwright? Um, the Spanish playwright. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is a quiz, who's, who can give us that answer? Lorca, right? Lorca, Lorca, yeah. Lorca, Lorca, yeah. Lorca. thank yeah. you. Um, uh, so, um, so that was the first time I was given this term and she had a reading list that she supplied with it. So I got busy. If people were gonna say that I was writing magical realism, then I better figure out who these other people were. Uh-huh. Yeah, Did that's- that, a question yeah. who the author of Ink was again? Inc. Uh, Sabrina Vorbulius. Perfect, thank you. And if, um, let's see, if I detach myself from these headphones, <laughs> I can go grab a book. Hang on. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And just so everybody knows, we did link uh, Eagle Harbor Books. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, get uh, Kathleen's book. It is lovely and beautiful. Everybody can see it, as well as One River, A Thousand Voices. Um, and the information on Claudia's uh, poem is also in the link. So if anybody's interested in learning more about the Columbia River Project, uh, it is in there as well. Hello. Thank you, Sarah. There we go. Ink. Oh, uh huh. And her name is Sabrina. The last name is spelled V-O-U-R-V-O-U-L-I-A-S. And this was a book that was reissued. And I wrote the foreword to, this, to the second um, edition of it. Very interesting, very timely. That's wonderful. Thank you for that, Kathleen. We have another incoming yes, question. Yes, I think you'll like it. Would love to know what you two are Make writing now. What's next and whom are you both reading currently? Go ahead, Claudia. Um, well, I have, I wrote, um, I was invited to write an essay actually last year um, as the pandemic had us in its grip, which is still does, but even more so. And we were out in the street marching. Um, so I wrote this essay and then the essay is now part of a book that's coming out next week. And I actually mm -hmm. have the book. I was sent a copy of it. It looks like this. Um, and it's a collection of essays. There's a revolution outside my love, uh, letters from a crisis. So most of the book has, a lot of the essays on the book are dispatches from cities. So I have one that's a dispatch from Seattle and um, you know, I'm, uh, I was struck, my, my daughter graduated from high school last year and of course she did it, she finished a year from home, but
but she became very active. She was already active um, at the high school and became active outside of the household um, and, the, and the school and organized a protest, a youth protest. So I'm weave, you know, just the, my own history coming from El Salvador and watching my parents march and uh, they were both teachers in El Salvador. This is right, as, right before the war, uh, the civil war that eventually made us flee El Salvador. And so I'm comparing, you know, watching my parents go do sittings, marches, um, and then here watching my, my children also organize and go out in the streets. So it was, a, it was an interesting, it was, it was interesting writing it and seeing how history has these threads through one's life. Yeah. You're part of this river. Sorry? You're part of this river. Yes, exactly, exactly. And Kathleen, you're writing what things, huh? I have to confess, I'm writing another novel. Um, but I think the first two chapters, I have this way of writing where the chapters are sort of freestanding and can often be published as short stories separately. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the first chapter in this has already been accepted and I'm just finishing the second chapter and um, let's see I thought I said Donna's here somewhere Donna I'm going to try to have four chapters of this novel done by the time we go to Macondo this summer so that I'll have something to work with we're both going to to Macondo which is a, a writers uh, conference oh, and that's we're, we're, we're pretty yeah. excited because we've both also been rejected twice before <laughs> And that's a, we've tried to go. Yeah, right. That's in San Antonio. It's typically in San Antonio, but it will be virtual this time. Oh, got it. Yeah. Uh, but, okay. but we hope to, uh, in the future, be part of that community. Uh, yeah. Again, trying to link up, you know, the different places that we are with with people who are writing work that that resonates with what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading. Um, I guess it's an autobiography by Cecilia Aragon uh, called Flying Free. And she came one summer to the uh, NILA program that I used to teach in, the low residency MFA program on Whidbey Island. And I see Stephanie, in one of the boxes, and that's also a mayor who went through that program. So Cecilia wrote a book um, about um, being a person who was afraid of everything. Um, deliberately doing the things that scared her. And she eventually became a stunt pilot. Uh, and so she does um, aerobatics, it's called. Um, and the US has a team that goes and competes on an international level every year. So I'm just, I'm getting towards the end of the book where she actually goes to, to compete in this thing. And um, it's interesting, it's very interesting to, to read something a little different. I, I try to mix up my my write, my reading and not just read books by people like me that are, you know, novels or short stories. So once in a while I throw in a, a biography or, or a memoir. I love that, Kathleen, because I I find myself returning to poetry again and again. I think Maybe because I served as the poet laureate last, you know, the past three years, I was deeply engaged with that. I my my reading uh, really is so circumscribed to poetry oh. um, that I, I look forward to <laughs> to. And I, I don't know. Maybe it's also the style of reading because you could read, you know, five poems or you know, right, and, and then put it down and then come back to it the next day. I read poetry too. Uh, even though I don't write poetry. And I just read Natalie Diaz's book and it just knocked me out. And I, I read, I thought, I just have to start reading it again from the beginning, but I didn't do that. I'm, I'm letting it sit for a week or so, and then I will read it again. There mm -hmm. were some lines right in the middle of it that just slayed me. So I have to go back and, and read those and think about them. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have the book, I have not read it. Um, I'm reading Wanda Coleman, um, 
you know that's a this is a, a compilation of her of her work this uh, book just came out um edited by terence hayes mm -hmm. and i had heard she's an la poet she lived in la um and i lived in la uh and never had read her but wow she's mm -hmm. amazing um it's just really raw uh mm -hmm. she, she's so honest uh, and unafraid and it's just wonderful there's so much power there um so i'm reading that i'm reading um jim harrison um again a book of, of gazals or gazals however that word is pronounced uh -huh. uh, gazals i think yeah um, yeah interesting because um the other book the other novel <laughs> i'm writing and i did not mean to start two novels i don't recommend those um, is set in 10th century Spain, in which poetry was one of the greatest assets you could have as a diplomat. You had to be able to um, compose verse on the fly spontaneously at court in order to be considered an intelligent and valuable human being. So I have spent some years researching this novel um, because of the time and place. And for a long time, I thought, thought, oh, this is really interesting. And then I thought, oh, I can't write this. Which point of view would I ever use to write this book? And then I came across a class of people and I realized one of these people could tell this story. So that's where I'm at. And I've got about 80 pages of that. And it's all about poetry. So at some point, I'm gonna have to either learn how to write poetry <laughs> or uh, turn the whole book over to someone who knows how to write poetry. I don't know. Well, but your book, Spirits of the Ordinary, has poetry in it, too. It does have some poetry in it, and it's it, it's imitative in many ways. So I didn't think of it as, I'm writing this poem. I thought of it as, I'm writing a poem of the sort that would be in a book like this. So um, I guess if I can keep fooling myself, eventually I can write more poetry. Yeah, I mean, it, isn't that what poets do is, is study form and then and then reproduce it, right? I mean, with, with slight variations, sometimes actually staying very close to the form that you're trying to imitate, right? I mean. Yeah, I guess, um, I don't know. I, I really feel like I'm wading through a, a thicket, you know, kind of trying to make my way through the underbrush of, of what is um, what is an authentic verse, you know, what is authentic poetry as opposed to imitative poetry. Mm -hmm. And having introduced that subject, someone else would need to <laughs> carry it forward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting listening to you say that because I, in the previous comment that you made about working and creating in community, uh, mm -hmm. as working in, in writing with others. And I think that when I was, when I'm with a group of people, brand new, never met folks, you know, someplace in a small town or anywhere really, I, I, I carry a, a firm belief that we could all, that we are all poets actually, and that, it, and that we could all write poetry. Um, and that there is a distinction between the poem and the form, right? The poem is the feeling and poetry is about the feeling. That's why we read it. I mean, you said Natalie Diaz's poem slayed you. There's power, there's something there yes. that was powerful, that there was a feeling that got communicated. And we all are capable of feeling, in fact. We all do. We always have, right, since we're little. So um, the, the form part is, is a different, it's a learned aspect of it. But the poetry part is innate to all of us. And I see that in this book by Natalie, in that I read her first book when my brother was an Aztec. Mm -hmm. And it's also just an amazing book, but it's almost all feeling and emotion. Um, and I didn't realize that until I picked up this book and I thought, oh, she's become a master of form now as well. And she starts out with this, this, these very formal, again, as a, as a non-poet, I don't know what they're called, but 
but certain references and certain meters and rhymes that she uses. And then she kind of opens the book out into something a little wilder and a little um, more elemental. You know, again, the river is a very strong theme all the way through this book. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I learn from poets. I do try to read at least one book of poetry a year on top of everything else, because I see this, this uh, mastery of language in it that I think anyone can learn from and anyone can apply it to their work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should apply that to the other way around and read more prose. Um, <laughs> you know. Well, you can tell a different kind of story in prose. You can go ahead and, um, and build a fairly elaborate house and then furnish it with, with different people in different situations. Yes, I agree with that. I, I wholeheartedly agree that there's, um, that it allows for different, um, different paths. Prose allows you to go different places for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kathleen, we have a question for you from uh, the owner of Eagle Harbor Books, Jane Danielson. She says, Kathleen, you write both fiction and nonfiction. Your book, Deepest Roots, was such a massive and well-received study of our community here on Bainbridge. Do you prefer writing fiction or nonfiction? Well, I think I prefer writing fiction because when you write nonfiction, people correct you. <laughs> And they will say, well, you got this wrong and you got this wrong. Though I have to say that happens with my fiction as well. When I wrote Spirits of the Ar Ordinary, um, people wrote to me, and this is when people still wrote real letters and had to spend a stamp on it, um, to say, well, that's not the name of that place. And that's not what that looks like. And so I'd have to write and say, well, um, that was the name of this place before the Mexican Revolution, during which, after which they changed all the names. And um, yeah, I know that place doesn't really look like that, but that's just how it turned out. So uh, the same thing with, with, uh, with fiction. And, and now I don't know what possessed me to write such a specific book about the community I actually live in. Um, and I, I'd say I got 90% of it right. And I did get a few things wrong. Mostly I um, accidentally misnamed some people in the book. But I think the part about our relationship to the land is right. And I did research that carefully. And I did um, work with people, indigenous people, who have a very elemental relationship with the Suquamish territory. And much of the book, and I guess all of my writing, is about our relationship with the land. What is our relationship with the land? Um, what am I doing here? And who's living on the land my ancestors came from in the Sonoran Desert, right? And how do they feel about it? So um, I guess these are all topics that are always sort of churning around in my head all the time. Yeah, and the way, you know, the way landscape seeps into oneself, right? Mm -hmm. So then that your consciousness is also tied to landscape. Uh, that's, that's, what I kept on thinking with your book, reading those, um, reading the way place shows up and this beautiful, beautifully rendered like paintings, like I said, um, landscapes that you have that could only come in a way, and that, that my, to my question earlier, if you had visited, if you, if you have it inside you to write, to write that. And when you said you did all that travel when you were a kid, you absorbed all of it, right? I mean, our relationship to landscape shows up in language too, right? It's not just- it, Yes, it, it certainly does. Um, and I, I have to say, one of the interesting quirks about my writing is, excuse me, every time I sit down to write something new and you know, you're sitting there and you're confronted with the blank page and you think, well, I just have to start somewhere. I just have to start. And what happens is I will start with the description of the San Bernardino mountains that I lived in until I was six years old. And it's this very specific place. It's the sort of thing that Joan Didion, you know, would do who I, whose work I admire very much, but that little description means um, you are here. This is where I am in this place in Southern California. And then I can imagine out from there to 
the topic that I want to write about. Is it in Mexico? Is it in Chihuahua? Is it in Aguascalientes? Is it in Washington State? Is it in Seattle? Is it on Bainbridge Island? And then, you know, again, these, these things that we were talking about with prose versus poetry start to unwind themselves. And I start to follow those paths. And mm -hmm. I see, oh, I need to research this. I need to look this up. And so I start building that little house of the story or the book that I'm working on. I how, about you? how about you, Claudia? I, I know, I just love that idea that you, you, you know, you place yourself, you ground yourself in place. And then I have to. There. That's really amazing. I think that's happened to me to an extent with the house where I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, in El Salvador, which is this very old adobe house with red tile roofs built with a central garden. And, yes. you know, that was a big gardener. And so that that house has been, uh, is just such a clear stamp in my mind of the smells of it and just how it, how the rain fell upon the roof, what the earth smelled like with the first rains, just the mm. layer of the house so much of who I am is, is really about that, that house. Um, so, so yes, I do think that there are spaces where we find ourselves and where we, because I was a child too there, just as yes. you were, you described the mountains is kind of this, this safe beginning, this early start, this little seed. And, and from there, you know, everything else flourishes. Have you, have you written about that house? Mm -hmm. I've written about that house a lot. I have, um, I've been working on a memoir forever mm -hmm. and I keep on getting derailed because of poetry. <laughs> so, um, but I do have a, a completed draft of the memoir and, that, and, and it is built around this idea of, of, of home. And, you know, of course, because it's, it's about the war and my family's displacement from El Salvador and, and what is a home. And for me, the yes. home is always, actual a return to that actual house. I know that home, I mean, the book is a questioning of what home means. I don't have that house anymore. I haven't had it, right? But right. it exists uh, right. as a physical thing. Uh, and also in my imaginary. Um, so yeah, I have written about that house. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm just curious personally, um, what both, uh, you know, how did you start on each of your projects? One, Kathleen, how did you start? Like, what was your original point for Spirits of the Ordinary? And Claudia, where did this idea for this poem come from? Where did, where did you see, what, what's the seed that got planted for each of those? Well, for me, um, Spirits of the Ordinary started with the story of my great-grandparents' marriage, which was not good. And uh, my great grandfather had the gold fever and wanted to leave uh, and go out and, and explore and just was not suited to city life. For generations, our family lived in Saltillo, Mexico, uh, which is a town in Northeastern, well, it's a, it's a city, it's a big city in Northeastern Mexico. So when I started writing, these were the characters that evolved out of, out of the real people. And in some ways, um, my real great grandfather was, was even stranger than the person who I ended up creating as, as the fictional character in here. So, you know, fiction is so forgiving because you can sort of wander off. You don't have to give a, a true portrait of, uh, of, of a person. You can sort of mold the, um, the character to fit the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's great. That's wonderful. I like that. I feel this poetry does the same thing. It 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 folds and defies time and all kinds of linear thinking. And that's why I think I, I but that's why I love it so much. Um, How did you get started, Claudia, writing poetry? Uh, you know, it wasn't really a choice, Kathleen. I, it just, I would write a letter and it would resemble a poem, you know, it was, uh, wasn't really a choice. I, I have to say that it just happened to me that that's how my, I don't know, 
you know, if I, if I have any artistic inclination, it 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 showed up as as poetry, and I had to really um, own up to it because I didn't want it for a long time because it was a little bit of a nuisance to have this thing happen <laughs> to you, and eventually I realized, no, you know, this is I have to own up to this and um, and step up to it, and my life changed once I did that, but yeah, but that's that's how I started. We're glad right. you didn't. We're glad you didn't suppress it. We're glad yeah. you let it take over your life. Yeah, it did. It it took over my life completely. I often described it as a dog that kept on biting, you know, biting me and insisting I to come along with it. This little dog that would never go away, and I would pick it away and maybe bite <laughs> something, and it would disappear, and then it would show up again. And one day, you know, once I said, okay, I'll, I'll follow you, I'll, I'll do what you want me to do, it never returned. The dog oh. just never came back. It's interesting. It's, yeah. That yeah. was it. That, that was, was the right impulse. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting that it manifested in this, in this dog. I actually have a poem about that. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's mystery to it. You know, there's a mystery to it. And we just have to acknowledge. Um, I mean, writing is like that. I think writing, it, there is mystery to it. Where it follows you, where, where you sat down to write this story and it suddenly showed itself going this way and you there is daring in the allowing yourself to follow that impulse, right? There's, there's daring in that. Yes. And, um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of writing, the impulse is the same, the form switches around. Um, and the more you write, the less reluctant you are to go where it wants you to go. I think I that's think been that's true of writing. Yes, but, yes, because you you trust that whatever this impulse is, whatever this energy is, it knows why it's taking you in this direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Both of you have done such a wonderful job. Uh, we are so happy to have both of you. We are gonna wrap it up here. Um, I was wondering, does anybody else in the audience have any last questions we wanted to answer before we go here? Um, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, if not, feel free to send an email. We can answer uh, at Eagle Harbor Books, staff at eagleharborbooks.com if you have additional questions or wanna order um, Kathleen or Claudia's work, we would be happy to get that for you. And again, we are so excited that we had this conversation. It was beautiful. Both of you were so eloquent and there was so much to talk about and learn from both of you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, do any of you, uh, either of you have any last minute things you wanna say before we head out? I just wanna say- It's book. <laughs> oh, here's what my book looks like. <laughs> yes, go buy that book. Go buy that book. Claudia's is right here. And I'll there show everybody, it opens. I just want to give a shout out to all the people who came. I haven't seen some of you in a few years, so it's it's lovely to see you, even in a little box. Hi, Phil. <laughs> Hi, Mara. <laughs> okay, go ahead, <laughs> Sarah. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, and we will sign off. Everybody have a wonderful rest of your evening, and again, Claudia and Kathleen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for hosting us. Yes, take okay. care. Take care. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you, Kathleen. <laughs>